be hanging this ornament. War and Peace. Was Elijah one of the Jesus' ancestors? Mr. Butterfield folded his bottom lip over the top one. It was far too difficult to explain. Well, what about Elijah then? Was he? No, no, no. He and Elijah were prophets. Can't you see? They have a separate bow to themselves, but they often appear on Jesse trees. It's traditional. Why? Why are they there? If they aren't ancestors of Jesus, the carpenter dropped the little scraping tool he was using in, to hollow out the raven's eyes. It's traditional. I told you, tradition. But you must know. But you must know. Of course I know. Of course I know. Of course I do. Mr. Butterfield mopped his forehead with a dirty rag. The prophets are there because because they knew Jesus was coming even hundreds of years before he came. They caught little glimpses of him in their dreams. They pictured him in their vis visions and promised God, God's people that he really was coming. A redeemer, a rescuer, someone who would forgive them all their mistakes. A descendant of Jesse will appear. That's what the prophet Elijah told them. A shoot will bring from the stock of Jesse, and from this, the, his roots a bud will blossom. Long before the prophets, Joseph, Moses, and all of the people I've told you about trusted God to rescue them, but the prophets knew some of Joseph and Moses did not, didn't. God had told them he would send a savior, the Messiah, someone who fight off the worst giants, someone to guide them back to Paradise Garden. So, so where are these prophets? Show me. Mr. Butterfield pointed out a row of symbols dangling from one bough of his oaken Jesse tree. Here, look. Here's one of the ravens that fed Elijah in the desert Jerusalem after they were destroyed. And there, here is, here's a, a plow for Elijah. He, was he a farmer then? I told you, weren't you listening? He was a prophet. I t thought prophesying might be a part-time job. Why a plow? Because, he said, there would be because he said there would come a time one day when there would be no more war and the people would hammer their swords into blades for their plows. Imagine peace, blessed peace. Mr. Butterfield was it, said it fully. His head was spinning. Next, I'll carve a bear in here to represent Elijah. Oh, a bear? Why a bear? Tell about the bear. The questions buzzed like horns around Mr. Butterfield's head because a crowd of good-for-nothing small boys waylaid him and jeered him, jeered at him and called him names and chanted, Go on, Bally, go on, Bally, and mocked him and pursued him, pressured him until he couldn't stand anymore. So he cursed them black and blue. And two, two she-bears came rampaging out of the woods and ate them all up. Now will you let me get back to work? The boy bolted. A moment later, a car the carpenter set started after him, swaying and unsteadily from foot to foot, arms upraised and looking very like a charging bear. Stop, wait, clang the metal the big metal latch of the door cr cracked shut. He banged against the baptismal font, making the water slop. Bow, basimal, in front, making the water slop. He steadied himself and opened the latch, but the street outside was already empty. 
weary, weirdly, he stumbled down on a big oak chest by the door. I'll bet Eliza regretted that temper of his, he said under his breath. I know I do. The bear that he carved that day was very, very, not very fierce at all. In fact, it wore an anxious sort of smile and stood on its hind legs, stretching its neck for all the world as if it was watching out for a long-awaited friend.